I guess good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our webinar on corn ethanol. Um, it's fantastic to see so many people registered uh, regionally. Um, throughout all the cross North Dakota, we have people. And I hope a lot of you are getting some much needed rain today. And then um, people registered, registered from outside our state as well. So welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Dana Hager, and I serve as the executive director for the Ethanol Council. And today you're going to hear from Dr. David Ripplinger. He's a bioenergy economics from NDSU. Um, and really, I hope that today Dave will shed some light on many important topics impacting the ethanol and corn industries in our state. Um, I do have to give a shout out to our sponsors for this webinar, um, North Dakota Ethanol Council, also with the North Dakota Corn Growers Association, NDSU obviously, and in support with the Office of Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency with the North Dakota Department of Commerce. So those are the folks that brought you this webinar today. Um, before we dive in, I do want to encourage you to ask questions in the chat or um, in the Q&A portion as well. We are also recording this webinar and we will send a follow-up link um, after the recording. So with that, I know Dave has lots to say and only an hour to say it all. I will turn it over to you, Dave, and have a good webinar. Great, so I'll go ahead and get started. Yeah, so my name is Dave Ripplinger. I work for NDSU Extension, a professor in the Department of Agribusiness and Applied Economics, and have worked in the biofuel space uh, for almost 12 years, uh, primarily in this position, uh, which was actually created directly by the state uh, to work with farmers and industry to support the biofuels industry, which has uh, been in place for a long time, but there's a lot of exciting things going on, a lot of things that have happened recently, um, which are you know, very supportive of increased economic activity uh, and increased demand for uh, different crops that we produce within the state. So I'm going to have a, a specific focus and a few things I'm going to try and get across today, uh, really looking at the future of corn ethanol. Uh, we're really at a crossroads where there's going to be a lot of changes that are going to be impacting uh, farmers uh, as well as the biofuel industry. Some of those will be elective. Many of them are, are going to be all but required in order to uh, really have market access for both biofuel feedstocks as well as for other food crops that we might grow in the state. Uh, getting a little bit of background. So many folks who are familiar with corn ethanol are, are familiar with the RFS. Uh, so the RFS the renewable fuel standard was the original federal law that really provided the basis for the build out of the biofuel industry, including the corn ethanol industry. So that law mandated the use of biofuels. It doesn't mandate the use of corn ethanol, but it provided a, a, a support structure uh, to guarantee the use of biofuels. And so within a short period of time, we saw a dramatic build out in corn ethanol uh, refining capacity in the United States, primarily, primarily, you know, early on, but we've had a, a new uh, refinery since that 2012, including in North Dakota. Uh, but it's important to note a couple of things about the RFS. Uh, the original motivation in, in you know, 2025, uh, you know, 20, 2005 was, you know, 20 years ago, uh, really kind of a different place in our nation's history you know, it was a unique period because there was a convergence of interest from different stakeholders who aren't necessarily uh, in agreement with each other. So we had the farm block, the environmental uh, progressives, as well as traditional uh, petroleum companies looking at some of the same things saying, gosh, you know, we have some environmental issues we have to deal with. We have some energy security issues we have to deal with, and we're always interested in supporting the rural and ag economy. And so the RFS kind of became this natural policy to benefit all three of those groups. And one of the important things to note about how the RFS works is that it creates different buckets. And what happens generally is that a, a specific biofuel like corn ethanol has its own bucket. And so it's in a category. Um, that's important because how it interacts with that policy is different than how it interacts with other policies. So basically, if you have corn ethanol, you are a conventional biofuel, and that will dictate how uh, your fuel will be treated uh, in the market created by the policy. Talking again, I get more specific about North Dakota, but what we saw between 2005 and in our case, 2014, 
was uh, six new refineries uh, in the state, uh, dramatic build out in capacity, you know, a little over 500 million gallons of capacity, uh, as well as, you know, corresponding with that, a significant uh, new home for North Dakota produced corn, you know, 160 to 180 million bushels of corn per year. That's about a third of last year's crop, which was, you know, a, a fair size crop. But again, you know, for, for decades, we've always been looking at value added egg in North Dakota and, and corn ethanol refining has certainly fit that bill. You know, also too, just talking about some of the direct benefits, you know, employees, a lot of, a lot of folks were very well paid uh, because they're, t- they're, they're you know, skilled uh, and, and, and bring value to the business. And then finally, just overall, it brings a lot of activity to the state economically, both directly and indirectly as it impacts uh, back through the supply chain to corn and corn production, uh, and then in other ways it, at, at local and state levels as well. It's it's, it's one of those things where I, I think about it, you know, obviously when these corn ethanol refineries were being built, it was a very big event for especially the community communities they're located in. But in some respects now, 10 to 20 years later, they're just part of this fabric. They're kind of part of where we are. We might not necessarily have them up of mind. Uh, Speaking again, just of kind of where the context, where, where we are today, what the context is today, um, understanding how we use ethanol in the United States. So ethanol in the United States, we don't really use as a fuel. For the most part, we use it as a fuel additive. And this is an important distinction. Um, we use it primarily to blend uh, with gasoline uh, you know, in order to achieve certain characteristics. And so there's a... a dimension of of fuel referred to as octane that we want certain levels of in order to uh, have the the fuel performance we'd like. And so really the primary driver of ethanol today is for its value as an oxygen to provide that higher octane. And that's driven, or at least initially was somewhat driven by the RFS, but really today it's driven by the market. It just so happens that it's a very affordable a fuel additive. Here's a, a list of the gasoline blend stock, which now today has an octane rating of 84. We have ethanol that has a rating uh, here. It can actually vary a little bit of 114. And these alternative oxygenates, the aromatics that you can see uh, across the bottom, those other blue lines. And really, again, where ethanol's found its place is in providing that octane at that 10% blend level, where now almost all ethanol sold as E10 and almost all gasoline in the United States is E10. Uh, Now here's a chart uh, from USDA and some private sources just looking at those relative values. And this happens to be on an octane equivalent basis. So you can see going back a decade, ethanol is typically the lowest cost source of of octane. And that's one reason why it's found a spot uh, in the market, at least to date. But we can kind of put a pin in it because what we're looking about here today is the future. And the the future story uh, is a little bit different. So as as most of you, I'm sure, are familiar, right now there's a lot of interest and activity in carbon, in greenhouse gas emissions and climate. Uh, It's impacting industries in different ways, government in different ways. And that's certainly true for the biofuel industry. And as we look at what's going to happen in the future, the primary characteristic that's going to drive value in ethanol is its carbon footprint. It is a lower carbon fuel per unit of energy than gasoline, but it needs to continue to maintain or reduce that level in order to maintain or possibly increase its value in the marketplace. And that's something we're going to focus on for most of the rest of the talk. Much of this is coming from the state of California, or at least initially came from policy uh, developed by the state of Cal- the state of California. So they have a low carbon fuel standard, uh, oftentimes referred to by its acronym LCFS. That law mandates the use of fuel with an ever smaller carbon footprint. So each year, the average carbon footprint has to be smaller than the year before and so on. And the neat thing about the policy, uh, which is overseen by the California Air Resources Board, which is essentially California EPA, is that it doesn't tell anyone what they have to do. It doesn't say, corn ethanol, you're in this bucket and we need to use this much. 
Instead, it says, if you bring fuel to market, if it has a higher carbon footprint, that's fine, but you're going to need to bring some fuel with a lower carbon footprint or pay for a credit from someone who does. And it's been very, very impactful because it incentivizes uh, innovation to reduce carbon uh, footprints generally, to reduce greenhouse emissions generally, and then also to allow investments and innovations bringing new biofuels to market. And we see that uh, most obviously recently with renewable diesel. The, the market itself that's made by this is a regulatory market. and But again, there's this, this policy behind it that drives uh, all of this activity. An important thing to note in the distinction between the LCFS and the RFS is that the low carbon fuel standard incentivizes even a small change in a fuel's carbon footprint. That's different. So again, with the RFS, if you're corn ethanol, you're a conventional biofuel. If you're uh, in selling ethanol into California, your carbon footprint can actually change quite a bit uh, based on your facility, the inputs you use, your efficiency, the products you make. And that slight difference in carbon intensity of your corn ethanol you know, would generate that additional carbon credit, which is value. So this is very different. And as an economist, you can see how that difference can drive value, can drive innovation, because now there's this interest for fuel suppliers to search for low carbon fuels that are priced right. And that has led to a large uh, a market for corn ethanol, uh, as well as for other biofuels. Important to note that as of today, the LCFS does not allow for farm level carbon footprints. So everyone uh, who's in the corn ethanol business uh, has a refinery in the Midwest uses something called Midwest corn. So everybody's footprint is the same at the farm level, but for refineries, it can be different. Again, maybe based on the electricity they use, how much natural gas they use, their yields and so forth. Um, but right now it's in the, the, footprint for the feedstock itself in this place, corn, is the same for all uh, corn ethanol refineries. Uh, just a little bit of background on measuring greenhouse gas emissions. Everyone who's on, you will be learning so much more about this in the next 10 years, if you like it or not. Um, it's certainly coming your way. Uh, I've been working uh, in this space, as I mentioned, for 10, 12 years, uh, and this has always been part of my space, my within my job description, a tool in my toolbox, uh, because it's very, very important to biofuels and now even more so. Um, but it also extends, just as a note, to other agricultural products, uh, especially food ingredients, uh, those that might be closer to a consumer, that carbon footprint matters. Anyways, there is a, a framework uh, that's been developed over decades and is now quite standardized to estimate greenhouse gas emissions for any product or service. Uh, goes by an acronym LCA, an Environmental Life Cycle Assessment. That can actually look at things other or in addition to the greenhouse gas emissions, but that's really the focus, especially in the biofuel space and especially today. Uh, in the United States, we've clearly seen, especially in the last two or three years, the uh, almost complete acceptance, the widespread acceptance and, and widespread support for a certain tool to model emissions, which is called the GREAT model. And I have the acronym uh, in parentheses below, uh, but that was developed by Argonne National Lab, is very flexible, user-friendly. 10 years ago-ish, when I first started using it, I was probably one of, you know, maybe a few hundred who uses it. Now there's tens of thousands of folks who are very familiar with this because they recognize, understand just how important these greenhouse gas emissions are to the value of their products. Um, stop for a second, and you don't officially have to answer. It's more a rhetorical question. Uh, and I hope that some of you uh, do know the answer but a question, what activity or input is the largest single contributor to corn ethanol's carbon footprint? I'll give you a second. You don't have to answer, so you don't have to be 
You can't be proud of yourself if you're right or embarrassed if you are not. But it's actually nitrogen fertilizer production and particularly use. Um, nitrous oxide is a very powerful greenhouse gas. The biggest single source of emissions in the entire supply chain is the nitrogen fertilizer that is emitted to the atmosphere, which unfortunately doesn't make it into the plant. Um, but we do look at all parts. That's one of the conditions of conducting a life cycle assessment. And here is a presentation of a recent calculation by Michael Wong, who was the developer of GREET and continues to uh, create and update uh, carbon intensity, carbon footprint estimates for a number of different fuels. And so if we look at this uh, figure, we can see both those uh, corn production related emissions, which would be the light blue, and then it's broken off to the right, as well as the emissions during refining, getting to the final user, and then actually tailpipe emissions. And then we also have land use change. But here we can see that that N2O, that nitrous oxide being a major source of emissions. We also have urea fertilizer, which is just an alternative form of uh, nitrogen fertilizer. It happens to be the CO2 that's attached to the, the molecule that's released in the field that is the, the emission there, uh, chemical manufacturing and so forth. Anyways, the a, a general takeaway for this is that there is a very well-developed field to estimate greenhouse gas emissions, especially in biofuels. Uh, there's a number and a growing number of experts uh, in this area. And there's also this companion group of business developers and so forth, businesses, organizations, governments who recognize the potential impacts of decarbonization to the biofuel industry, to agriculture. And much of that is based on the work that comes from conducting an LCA. Uh, here's an example of a an actual, and this might be dated, I, I pulled this, this information uh, last fall, but it's the carbon intensity for a North Dakota ethanol refinery. Uh, so Hankinson Renewable Energy uh, is, you know, in, in Hankinson, North Dakota. And so this is from California's Air Resources Board. So they're the regulator and they oversee uh, pathway applications, which provide a significant amount of information for each fuel provider. And they calculate a carbon footprint or carbon intensity for all of the fuels sold in California. So here we can look at the left-hand side and see at uh, Hankinson Renewable Energy, they're using Midwest corn because everybody does. It's a dry mill. They produce, and this is their specific carbon intensity for when they're producing dry distiller grains with solubles. Could be different, would be different if they were wet. They also extract corn oil and syrup. They use natural gas. They use electricity off the grid. Uh, and they transport their ethanol by rail to California. So behind uh, that single number is a great deal of information from uh, that particular refinery. And then also based on these different uh, assumptions for that, that particular unit of fuel. And I don't know how many different pathways uh, Hankinson Renewable Guardian has, but it's probably a few, one also with wet distillers and so forth. Um, but that ends up being a really valuable number. That number 68.72 is substantially less than the gasoline number. And that difference, it, you know, this is a lower carbon fuel, so it can create that credit, cr create that value uh, by being marketed into the state of California. And this kind of leads to, to where we are looking towards the future. So we've had the RFS and that's still in place. We have the low carbon fuel standard, which is also expanded to Oregon and California, uh, all of Canada as of this year. Uh, mostly off farm practices have been considered. Again, for the RFS, there's a, there's a, a bucket that corn ethanol is put into for California to date, there's one single number for corn. In Canada, we we are going to be able to use on-farm emissions, different emissions, uh, allowing a refinery to provide multiple estimates for 
feedstocks produced in different ways. So, for example, if you, you produce no-till corn, which might have a smaller carbon footprint. But really what's being driven here is, is, is a couple of things. There are signals from low-carbon fuel standard states and countries uh, to reduce emissions. There's the same thing coming on the food side, the corporate food side, uh, the corporate ag side as well as federal policy. And they're going to strongly encourage, primarily through market uh, mechanisms to start, uh, to reduce the emissions associated with most farm products. And so at the top of the list of that is corn and soybeans. But there's different ways that we can do this. And I, we're, we're getting to this point where uh, an understanding of what these things are and how they can work is, is uh, kind of hip pocket information that, that most folks should know. Um, the first thing off the list is actually to do nothing. Um, and by that, I mean the American corn farmer is typically ever more productive year over year. The trend line yield is positive. And so simply by trying to be efficient, you know, trying to be profitable, they are going to, you know, use as little input as possible, use it most efficiently as possible, get the most yield out of it as possible, uh, completely ignoring what they might be hearing from uh, other market signals or from the government. There's also more deliberate things that can be done. Um, one of the easiest lists would be to swap or change to a less carbon intense input. The easiest example or most obvious example of this to me today would be using a low carbon nitrogen fertilizer. So these really aren't widely available on the market, but I can make uh, ammonia and other nitrogen fertilizer uh, with hydro. And in fact, actually, we do have quite a bit of that with, with Yara and, and, and Norwegian uh, fertilizer. Uh, we also have production of what's called blue ammonia, blue nitrogen fertilizer, where the, the carbon, the CO2 is captured uh, during the production of nitrogen fertilizer and then stored uh, in the geology. Um, and then also we have a green nitrogen fertilizer, which isn't available at, at commercial scale yet too. But the nice thing about a product like this, as it does come to market, is that it would be a simple swap where I could swap out my traditional ammonia for a lower carbon ammonia. You know, very simple, very straightforward. Um, another thing we can do is, is again, uh, kind of following under that first heading too, but just increase efficiency. So we have all of this stuff going on with precision egg, uh, with new technology to more efficiently use inputs. And that again, reduces that, that carbon footprint for corn or whatever crop that's resulting from it. And then finally, we can also have some more significant actions, which would be changing production practices. This may include things like uh, no-till, reduced till cover crops and the like. That is a, uh, a much bigger change uh, for a, a farming operation, uh, especially relative to just swapping out inputs or adopting some new technology and being more efficient in the use of some inputs. Moving over to the refinery side, we've actually seen a lot of investment and innovation in the US corn ethanol industry in the last decade in response to the low carbon fuel standard. One of the first thing that, that happened was uh, a general revisiting of the efficiency of existing corn ethanol plants. There was an additional incentive beyond just using less energy uh, to better calibrate, refine, maybe make investments to be more productive, more energy efficient, and receiving not just that avoided cost of paying more for natural gas uh, and the like, or, you know, somewhat increasing your yield of, of, of ethanol, but then also capturing value from a low carbon fuel standard market like California. The other one that kind of, that came closely after that was also this investment of technology to remove corn oil from distillers grains. Uh, and that corn oil typically goes into biofuel production that could be renewable diesel or biodiesel. But that was something that really was driven in large part by the LCFS and has been a, 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 a very nice additional source of, of revenue uh, for corn ethanol refineries. And then my, my, my bold little teaser is something much bigger to come. 
Um, and there's there's work on that. But before I talk about that issue, I do want to talk a little bit about the carbon cycle uh, and biogenic emissions. So within uh, the natural environment, we do have carbon cycling in various ways, from the atmosphere to above ground life to carbon in the soil, um, carbon in the water or oceans, and again, this natural uh, movement that you know that's been in place for a long time. More recently, with the Industrial Revolution, we've made use of fossil fuels, which have increased uh, emissions, uh, brought more uh, CO2 into the atmosphere, into the system, uh, which is kind of uh, kind of where we sit today. The, the, the science, the thought behind it is that the increase in greenhouse gases uh, has an impact on the atmosphere. There's a greenhouse gas effect that those additional gases trap energy in the atmosphere. It can lead to changes in not just weather, but actually climate. Um, I'm going to take a brief aside to motivate things. Uh, but there's among the many different technologies being discussed today or being pursued today uh, is one called direct air capture. So there's a few uh, companies around the world who are uh, leading the innovation in this space. And really what this does is uses either chemical or mechanical means to uh, separate CO2 from other gases uh, in the air, uh, compress it. Uh, move it and then store it in the geology. So this is this is somewhat akin to a carbon capture off of a, a coal-fired power plant, for example. But in this case, the, the 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 CO2 is coming directly from the atmosphere. I have a picture of a facility in Iceland uh, where one of the the leading organizations is. Looking at where it's at today, uh, it's very expensive. About eight hundred dollars per metric ton of CO2 if not more, depending on, on where you look. The expectation is that by 2030, that number might fall uh, considerably, but still 200 to $300 per metric ton. What's also interesting to note is that this is a very small scale technology and that a facility that might cost $20 million would only end up removing 4,000 metric tons of CO2 per year which if you look at total global emissions is a drop in the bucket. And so the idea or what I'm trying to motivate here is this method alone to try to capture CO2 of the atmosphere would be a multi-trillion dollar effort um, to capture, move, and then store CO2 at a cost of two to $300 per metric ton anticipated uh, in about six years. So then here's your second quiz for the day. Um, are there other ways to capture carbon dioxide from the atmosphere? So I did ask this question of some NDSU students about two weeks ago and they did relatively poorly. I don't think they were necessarily ready to talk during class, uh, but this should be hopefully obvious and I don't before I tell you, and it will certainly be obvious once I tell you what the answer is. Um, this goes back to elementary school science, but how do we, capture CO2. And there's your hint. And then of course, photosynthesis. Um, if you think about what agriculture has done for thousands of years, we've been using our ingenuity to capture energy from the sun and harness CO2 uh, to feed ourselves, to provide different needs that we have and more recently for fuel and other purposes. And this is important to note, because if we think about what happens within corn production and even corn ethanol production, uh, there's a unique opportunity. And this is the idea that the corn plant itself is going to make use of and store atmospheric CO2 within the plant itself, including the grain, the kernel. As that kernel is moved to a corn ethanol refinery, that CO2 ends up being released during fermentation, that's one of the, the co-products of fermentation, CO2. It happens to be very, very pure, um, you know, food grade, industrial grade, ready to go, as opposed to pretty much every other source. So we think about what we've done in terms of innovation and investment and improvement in 
making use of the natural environment through agriculture and corn is maybe the best example of that. Then we've also built out this, this corn ethanol industry, which produces uh, a significant amount of relatively pure CO2, uh, as opposed to the direct air capture method, which requires a dedicated facility, a dedicated investment, and is far more costly. Um, leads to related questions and then talk about these carbon dioxide pipeline projects. I first gave or used this slide in, in early October. And at that time, there were two pipeline projects under development. And within a week, uh, one of those projects had been shelved. Uh, for those of us in North Dakota, we're most familiar with Summit Carbon Solutions and the work that they're doing. Uh, the business model is that uh, a pipeline would be constructed and that CO2 from corn ethanol refineries would be collected and brought to appropriate geology, in this case in North Dakota, uh, and then injected, stored in proper geology uh, to help address climate issues. Um, both of the remaining projects are are facing, remain continue to face some challenges uh, with leases, uh, some government permitting, um, but they both are looking at taking advantage of this opportunity that's presented in part by federal policy, but also in large part by just the nature of agriculture and fermentation alcohol production. Speaking just a little bit about the financial incentives behind this, uh, by capturing and storing CO2 in geology, you'd reduce the carbon footprint of the ethanol that can be work that you know generates credits. Uh, there's also a, a a tax credit that's been on the books for quite some time called 45Q. Uh, everybody in North Dakota should know what 45Q is. So it's for carbon capture, storage, and use. It could be from a coal-fired power plant. Uh, it could be from a corn ethanol refinery. Uh, and there's different values available depending on if the, the CO2 is going to be simply stored or if it's going to be put to use. And that could include enhanced oil recovery. Uh, but substantial sums, again, to drive that investment to address different things that we have. One is just generally innovation and, and taking some bigger, bolder, costly steps to address some of the challenges we have. And the other is to deliberately uh, reduce uh, the CO2 that's in the atmosphere. And now we get to the last point, and I, I hope I can emphasize this properly. And this is the idea that both it, it's policy in a couple of ways, tax policy, um, as well as just regulatory policy in the United States and elsewhere, where now they're really starting again to draw lines. And so the idea is there are thresholds uh, above which you may receive a premium or be able to participate in a program or receive a tax credit and below you will not. And this is very significant for all parts of the biofuel industry because that premium and being on one side or another of that threshold will dramatically impact your access to certain markets and the value of your product. And even though we're kind of in the early stages of this, I think the the long-term situation is relatively clear that biofuels, and I do state it as corn ethanol, is that you're, you're going to end up being segmented into high value and low value markets, high carbon and low carbon uh, products. And so if you happen to be on the right side, have that lower carbon intensity, you will have different opportunities, have access to different uh, the tax credits and the like, which could be very, very significant. And we'll see exactly how this all plays out. But to me, it really can't be ignored. And this is in in tandem with other things that are in uh, food as well, where if your carbon footprint is too big or you don't have a carbon intensity estimate, you may not be able to sell it into certain markets. Uh, and then finally, a specific biofuel uh, sustainable aviation fuel. This has gotten very popular very quick, which is uh, fantastic, a bit surprising. Uh, sustainable aviation fuel or SAF is jet fuel made from biomass. It's biojet. Um, you can get there 
through a variety of ways, but the most typical ways are alcohol to jet or bioethanol to jet. So I can take ethanol, uh, dehydrate it, break it up and recombine it and make a longer hydrocarbon uh, that meets the, the jet fuel spec. I can also use the same process, similar process to producing renewable diesel and, and an oil fat or grease. A lot of interest in it um, coming both from the corporate side, the global airlines are very interested in it, uh, have made varying level, types and levels of commitment to using SAF uh, with different timelines. And then also in the Inflation Reduction Act, which is now getting a little old, there's also significant financial support in the form of tax credits for the production of sustainable aviation fuel. And this is the example of making sure that you're on the right side. You have to have a carbon footprint that's substantially smaller or below a certain level to even qualify to be defined as a sustainable aviation fuel. So this could be a case where a corn ethanol refinery might really want to get into the business, but if their carbon footprint is too high, if bringing that to a sustainable aviation fuel product is too high, they won't be able to qualify for those tax credits to have market access and the like. And again, it's you know limiting your, your opportunities. This is all somewhat long-term, uh, but the things that we see on the horizon. I do have a, a last comment to make, and it's been very interesting being in the business for as long as I have. There has been also a fundamental shift in how the petroleum industry views biofuels. It used to be, and, and very strongly held, that biofuels were a negative because they displaced or took part of the, the gas tank, right? They were displacing refined petroleum products. That's not a desired uh, thing for someone who's in that business. But now the idea is completely shifted. Now, biofuels are appreciated because they can lower the carbon footprint of that entire blend and continue to support the competitiveness of the internal combustion engine. So the idea is, given the choice between using a, a little bit more biofuel or people using more EVs, They'd much rather use more biofuels. And this is creating a tremendously large market uh, for biofuels, again, primarily renewable diesel. Uh, the other thing I have to bring up, too, I get this question a lot, uh, and, and we're seeing this even more in, in, in news, even within recent days, the, the, the prospects for the internal combustion engine are still quite strong. We are not going to see a massive displacement of light vehicles, cars, and trucks uh, powered with an internal combustion engine. Uh, EIA, which is part of the U.S. Department of Energy, has their projections of, of sales as well as the size of the fleets. And there might not be growth, but there's certainly not this rapid decline or anything close to a complete replacement of, of the internal combustion engine. And one of the last things I want to bring up, because we do have uh, folks from the corn industry, uh, corn farmers, as well as the biofuel industry and others, I think the adage that businesses don't compete, but supply chains compete is very, very appropriate. Um, obviously, there can be some disagreement confrontation as, as you might do business with a supplier or a customer. But really what we're going to see going forward in the biofuel space uh, as well as in the food space, is that as we address this greenhouse gas issue, that working together to find ways to reduce emissions, um, to create value, to share value is going to be absolutely critical to the long-term success of, of these supply chains generally. And so I think that was my uh, last official prepared remark, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. And I will stop sharing. Thank you, Dave. I'm going to take a minute and just breathe. That was a lot of information in there. Um, do you want me to read the questions? Can you see them? Why don't you read them? Okay. Um, the first one, we're going to go back to when you were talking about the um, the California Air and the GREET model. It's Is carbon intensity score of ethanol used by CARB generally 
similar or accepted by other authorities that regulate greenhouse gases or is GREET used or does each jurisdiction set its own? Yeah, that's a great question. So GREET is the standard model um, that is used by many. Uh, the state of California has its own modified version of GREET that they use. Um, other states, the nation of Canada, use other models, not GREET, but they're very, very similar. Um, the estimates should be pretty close, but they're not the same. Um, the one thing I would note, too, is the state of California has been uh, overseeing the low carbon fuel standard for quite some time. And so they developed a system that's very val very credible, much appreciated, that is really the model for a lot of new jurisdictions to implement low carbon fuel standards. They're not going to take it uh, in its entirety, um, but it serves as a model. We've seen this in Brazil and we even see it in conversations in Minnesota where there's a lot of good work and good thought and experience with California and their LCFS that it's a good starting place for discussion. So there are different models. Greet kind of dominates. There's California Greet. Um, anybody, including myself, I can go in and tweak Greet. Um, if I happen to find it a, a, a credible estimate of lower carbon North Dakota corn, I can plug it right in and get a number. That's great. I, could, I might be able to publish it. But of course, it's the regulator you want to be able to communicate with, you know, to give them those numbers to to allow them to calculate that same lower carbon intensity. Thank you, Dave. This one kind of goes along with that. It says, in addition to California, what other states, countries have this low carbon fuel standard or are there likely some looking at it? In other words, yeah. will others follow California? Yeah. So great question. So. California is clearly at the lead. Uh, it's, it's a well-developed system, bureaucracy, if you will. Um, both Oregon and Washington State have had low-carbon fuel standards for a few years. They're really kind of ramping up. Many provinces in Canada have had, well, British Columbia has had a low-carbon fuel standard for quite some time, but many provinces, provinces have had their own biofuel policy. Now the entire nation of Canada has what's essentially a low carbon fuel standard. Uh, Brazil uh, has had a low carbon fuel standard closely modeled on California, gosh, for almost a decade. Uh, and then many other nations. And then we look at the potential growth, um, Colorado, Minnesota, Iowa, Illinois, New York State are, are some of those that are viewed as being some of the next adopters of a low carbon fuel standard. It's also important to note, too, that the, the renewable fuel standard, in some respects, has been kind of a, a stagnant policy, and that a lot of the effort to decarbonize transportation has been done by the low carbon fuel standard, specifically California, but now also other states and regions. Um, and, but we'll see exactly how, how it continues to grow but even just looking at the state of California, California is 10% of the transportation fuel market. So they alone are a big enough market to drive a lot, which we've seen. Uh, they do use a lot of corn ethanol. They also they currently use all of our renewable diesel. Canada is almost the same size market, and their, their policy is, is just as bold. So we're going to see a growing in size of these markets in terms of current fuel used. So can what North Dakota ethanol plants, if any, can sell into these low carbon fuel markets? Yeah, so it's actually North Dakota ethanol has been relatively well positioned. We have very good rail access into Canada. So we've marketed a considerable amount of ethanol uh, into British Columbia. Uh, we have uh, a unique fleet of ethanol refineries in the state. Uh, Spirit wood, you know, using waste steam. Uh, from a coal-fired power plant, small carbon footprint, same thing with Blue, fr Blue Flint. Uh, we now have both Red Trail and Blue Flint having carbon capture. Uh, Theraldson being large and big has you know some efficiency advantages. Uh, the idea is, yeah, if, if you have that smaller carbon footprint, you want to get it to those markets. And we've been really fortunate 
in the state to have uh, refineries who, who, who have done that and continue to do that. Thank you. I might need your help to, I'm going to read this question to you and I'm sure you'll take it, Dave, but um, uh, this individual, they've sat through a lot of these talks. Um, North Dakota is an egg state and there is a greater value to egg and 45Z. Why does it seem talks and education of 45Z is being gatekept by so many? How does 45Z not fit agriculture and farmers in a better way than pipeline? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, it's a little bit complex. So I I had a candidate 45Z slide in my deck that was the last one that didn't make it. Uh, so 45Z is another uh tax credit that came from the Inflation Reduction Act that's looking at uh, low carbon fuels. And 45Z is really exciting for agriculture because the regulator, the Internal Revenue Service, uh, who I you know wrote a check to yesterday, um, they're the regulator, but they have flexibility in creating their rules and they may allow farm level practices to be accommodated immediately within the regulation. And so that would be an absolute game changer where if I happen to be just at, within my own farm, somewhat, you know, I have some sort of situation that allows me to produce a, a crop focus on corn or soybeans with a smaller carbon footprint than others, I would be incentivized. And so that is absolutely tremendous. One of the challenges is you can't double dip. Um, and so the question would be, how would that exactly come about? You know, how would, how would the mechanism work? But yeah, 45 Z is, is, is in and of itself, a, an extremely powerful tax credit. If, and when the IRS extends the accounting to go all the way back to the farm or field level where an individual farmer or, or at the field level you might have a different carbon footprint. That that changes agriculture forever. Excellent, thank you. We've got a little more time here. Um, I'm gonna switch here to, uh, does ethanol impact the volatility of gasoline blends? As And is that the reason that 15% blends are less available in the summer? Does it essentially cause the fuel to evaporate more? Yeah, so that's, a, I mean, that's a really good question. Um, so one of the limitations uh, in the traditional use of of ethanol, especially in the summertime, is is a, a characteristic called reed vapor pressure, um, which is related to the the volatility of the of the fuel in its entirety. And so at certain levels of ethanol blend, you'll exceed uh, the reed vapor pressure. Uh, standards that were established quite some time ago. Um, for all intents and purposes, uh, you know, we have a, a unique environment. You know, we, we have had a decision where there's been a waiver of, of E15 restrictions in the summer uh, on an emergency basis. We had an announcement from the administration that we would have uh, a permanent waiver sometime for some select states that petitioned uh EPA and the federal government uh that so that remains that remains a concern it does uh present a small challenge to the full build out and maturation of E15 um but I think we'll see exactly how that goes and if you actually look into the mathematics behind it and the behavior of of these liquids with this in gasoline blends with increased ethanol, um, the the actual reasoning behind it to some extent falls apart. But that's that's a discussion for for chemists and others. Um, I'm going to throw this one out there, um, and not something that I've talked about much since I've been here either. But uh, why is lead no longer used as gasoline additive? It'll kill you. Uh, yes, and the question <laughs> is. Are there any lessons from understanding why not lead into the atmosphere? Could yeah. So, it? yeah. So we, we for consider. decades, we use tetraethyl lead uh, to, as, as our octane source and, 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 and lead, and this isn't lead, the element it's tetraethyl lead. 
uh, is a very harmful substance. Um, and so we did replace that beginning in the 50s ish with a with a uh, primarily with another oxygen called MTBE. That worked relatively well, but then we suddenly realized that that leaks of MTBE uh, from tanks into the environment were a, a very negative environmental consequence. And the movement from MTBE to ethanol occurred simultaneously or you know, around the same time as the RFS, because we had all of these folks who had MTBE in their system and they needed a replacement, but what would the replacement be and how can you quickly substitute for this, this product um, that has a very large market? And the RFS actually kind of helped solve that. You can still use you know, other aromatics, MTBE in certain cases, uh, but we've seen this continual transition. And also, if, if you want to go into the history of it, it is quite interesting. You know, the, the folks who ended up researching and supporting the use of tetraethyl lead were fully familiar with its harmful effects and also fully familiar with ethanol. But it was a way to use a product from their industry, which, you know, provides that additional incentive internally. I know we're not going to be able to get to everybody's. We do have somebody who wants a little bit more information on the tax credit, the 45Z. Um, basically, I've never heard of it. Can you give a little oh. bit more background on it? Yeah, yeah. So great question. And I'll, I'll give as much as I can. Um, so 45Z is, I believe it's called the Clean Fuels Production Tax Credit. It replaces the previous biodiesel production credit. Um, and what it does, it also says that you have to exceed a certain value and then we'll pay you incrementally, uh, you know, for reducing the carbon footprint. And this is great. This is kind of what everybody wants. It has this threshold, which is not ideal, but it basically says you got to do something new, um, maybe something innovative or make a big investment uh, to access the credit. Um, and then within it, you know, it's it's because like the LCFS, it provides that incremental incentive you know that ends up being a message through prices you know all around the markets that are touched and then the question is with I, the IRS as the regulator will the IRS allow individual farms or maybe the refiner to say I get my corn from these types of producers 20 percent of my the corn comes from no-till and 20% of my corn comes from this type of production practice. And if those, uh, if, if that crop with those characteristics has a smaller carbon footprint and that can directly benefit the refiner through that tax credit and we can get that back to the farmer, that's a tremendous thing. And again, it could be something as simple as saying, well, I'm going to use low carbon nitrogen fertilizer. Well, my goodness, I can tell you what the price that I would be willing to pay for low carbon nitrogen fertilizer is, given that the the corn ethanol refinery that I send my corn to will provide a certain premium. A uh, really exciting. Um, I, I'm happy to I'm happy to visit more, um, but it's it, it it was one of the additions that, and every the Inflation Reduction Act had so many different legs that were pro-energy in different ways. Uh, and, and 45Z ends up being very significant uh, as, as mentioned in the question previous, having you know potentially immediate significant positive impacts on agriculture, on production agriculture. Um, there's a part of a question here. We've got a couple of minutes left. Um, so are ethanol plants focused on the farmer practices yet? Yeah. So yes. So there's there's a lot of interest, and it's it, it's a challenge because first of all, there's a typically a very strong relationship between a refiner and their their corn farmers, and vice versa. Uh, there's a within cor the corn ethanol industry, there's a very strong understanding of current and evolving emerging opportunities. It's not quite there today where you can just flip a switch and do it, but all of this thought and investment 
and thinking about, you know, what technology might we need? Uh, what type of validation system might we need? Uh, what change in government policy might we be looking for for certain markets? Uh, that's absolutely at the forefront of, of, of a lot of the, the forward-looking thinkers in the corn ethanol industry. Uh, I'm going to do one more question for you and then we'll wrap up, okay? Um, this one asks, uh, talking about understanding ethanol production is kind of the first to go through this process because carbon's e easily captured. How soon do you think other manufacturing industries will be pressured or asked to capture or sequester, sequester carbon? Yeah, so I mean, we know that. So if you think about it, the big question is how does any given government or industry deal with emissions? And the truth is we don't have a uniform national policy for greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, we have a patchwork of some federal policies. We have the LCFS, which is huge. We have different policies for the, the power industry. And it's, it's, it's hitting different industries in different ways and with different magnitude. But, you know, those industries that reduce that release significant amounts of greenhouse gas are all very familiar with this. If it's uh, steam methane reforming for uh, for ammonia production, um, if it's concrete production and liming, uh, everybody's got this on their list. And then it's also this issue is like how. How much do we want to do? Well, certainly we'll do our homework and we'll look for clues, but how much do we want to do before there are incentives or regulations that might dictate what we have to do? But, you know, basically this has become a, a very important issue for, for many industries. Okay, thank you. That brings us right to the top of the hour. And I promised Dave to get him back to his real life right at one o'clock. Um, I do want to thank everybody for joining. One last final question, Dave. People who are, I know this is a lot of information, right? And so over a lot of people's heads. Um, is Where can people go if they need to find more information? Are there some really good resources out there? Um, so there's a few. If you go, the, the, the folks who might have some of the best refined products might actually be some of the the biofuel association so the clean fuels association the national ethanol council uh, rfa uh you can also if you have like a specific question feel free to call me um, i'm happy to chat uh there there are some somewhat dated extension materials from various land grant universities but really at the cutting edge of a lot of this, it is things like talks and conversations where most of the information is being shared. Okay. Thank you. Well, with that, I will let you guys on to your day. Enjoy your afternoon. I will send a follow-up recap um, and then by the end of the week. Um, so you'll have some more contact information for those of you that joined us. So thank you and take care. Mm -hmm.